community of faith that seeks to love, live, grow, and go like Jesus. Regardless of who you are or where you've been, everyone is welcome, really. If this is your first time with us, we feel honored that you would choose to worship here today. After the service, we would love to meet you and answer any questions that you may have about the church. We would also like to extend a warm welcome to our Facebook viewers. Though we wish that you could be with us, we're so excited that you could join us online. If this is your first time viewing the service, then please let us know in the comment section below. Here are a few things that you need to know this week. Looking for something exciting for the entire family to do this holiday season? Take a break from all the baking, the shopping, the endless rolls of wrapping paper, and join us for an unforgettable Christmas experience, complete with fun, games, music, and more. Jingle Jam, a Christmas celebration big enough for the whole family. Throughout the month of November, we're collecting K-Cups for hospice nurses at the Waltz Hospice Home. You can drop off your donations at the Cornucopia and the Fellowship Hall. This afternoon at 3 p.m., we will gather in the sanctuary to decorate for Christmas. Any and all help is appreciated. And then this afternoon at 6.30 in the chapel, CCM singer and songwriter Scott Wesley Brown We'll be having a concert hosted by St. Stephen's Catholic Church. Scott is an ordained Baptist minister and he has recorded 25 albums. His songs have been performed by stars like Amy Grant and Sandy Patty. All are invited to attend. The 61st annual Elkin Community Chorus will be hosted at First United Methodist Church on December the 3rd. There are two opportunities for you to experience the concert. The first performance is at 4 p.m. and the second is at 7 p.m. Members of the Chancel Choir have been invited to perform at Carnegie Hall on Memorial Day weekend, and you have an opportunity to help the choir get to New York City. If you send Christmas cards during the holidays, the choir will have a mailbox set up to drop your cards in on the table by the side entrance. Choir members will serve as mail carriers to deliver your cards. Please write first and last names on the envelope and place it in the corresponding box with the recipient's last name. The mailbox will be open starting November the 26th and the final cards will be delivered December the 20th. Instead of paying for postage, you can donate that expense to help the choir cover expenses as they sing at Carnegie Hall. All checks should be designated to choir trip in the memo and can be placed in the donations box by the mailbox. Contact Lance Newman if you have any questions. There's a trip planned for Southern Supreme Fruitcake Factory tomorrow morning. The van will depart from the church at 8 a.m. If you would like more details about this trip, then please see Haston Wall. If you have an announcement that needs to be shared in next week's Need to Know, then please email me by Tuesday of this week. God bless and welcome to worship.
Good morning. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord God, we gather together this morning to worship in spirit and in truth. As we all prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving this week, we come to this space with thankful hearts. You have supplied us with many wonderful blessings, God, and I pray that we would never take those blessings for granted. Help us appreciate all of the good things that we have in our lives. And may we not grow selfish with those blessings, keeping it all to ourselves, but find valuable ways to invest and give from our abundance. We know that the resources entrusted to us are not simply for us alone, but to benefit our neighbor and to make the world a more prosperous place. For the times that we've been selfish and greedy with your resources, We ask forgiveness and guidance from the Holy Spirit to renew our hearts and our minds towards generosity. In so many ways, money and possessions can be a blessing or a curse, depending on what we choose to do with it. So may our hearts choose wisely and righteously, Lord. We also acknowledge that while life is full of your blessings, life is also filled with circumstances that are crushing to our spirits and can weigh heavy on our hearts. So I pray that this community would lift one another up during this holiday season. May we lean on one another as a family for the love and support that we need. You are a good God who gives good things. So we lift our praises to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in the responsive reading. The time for harvest is close at hand. What have you done with the gifts God has given you? We have brought our gifts to the house of the Lord. Praise God for the gifts and for opportunities for service that they represent. We praise God for all the ways in which our lives have been blessed. Generous God, accept our gifts and our lives this day. Loving God, accept our praise and gratitude. Amen. Please stand now if you're able and join us in our call to worship hymn 613, The Servant Song, and kids can come down for kids' time.
what's this? Milk. It's a carton of milk, right? Uh, does anybody drink milk? Do you like milk? I like chocolate. Chocolate milk? Yeah, me too. Chocolate makes everything better, right? Yeah. Vanilla, milk. vanilla milk? Yeah, that's fair. Mm. Yeah, I've never had vanilla milk. Yeah. Okay, so this is a carton of milk. What happens if it stays in the refrigerator past its expiration date? It gets sour and it turns yogurt. Yeah, yeah. It gets sour. So have you ever um, tasted sour milk before or you opened it up and smelled it? And like, how does it smell? Yeah, it's rotten and sour and nasty, right? But we know that milk isn't the only food or drink that spoils, right? Yeah, like there's a lot of things that spoil. And so we have to eat those things, those foods, or drink those drinks before they go bad, or they're going to spoil and they could make our stomachs hurt, right? Um, So because we have to eat foods or drink drinks before they spoil, it makes me think of the phrase, use it or lose it. So I want you to keep the phrase, use it or lose it in mind, because we're going to come back to that in just a second. In today's scripture, Jesus tells a story about a boss, and this boss has some workers, and he gives these workers a lot of money, and they're supposed to take it and do something with it. Well, there's one worker who decides that he is going to bury the money to keep it safe. He doesn't use it um, for anything. So he goes and he buries the money. But when the boss finds out that he didn't invest the money, he lost all of it. It It got taken from him. So in other words, that one worker who didn't use the resources that he had, he didn't use it, so he lost it, didn't he? Yep, that's right. So he experienced the losing part of use it or lose it. So in the story that Jesus tells, there are also two other workers, and guess what? They took the money that was given to them by the boss, and they invested it, and they used it for good things, and they grew more and more because of the money that they invested, and it kept growing and growing and growing. So I think one reason that Jesus tells this story is to remind us that we're supposed to use the gifts and the resources that God gives to us because God can grow those things into even bigger and better gifts so that we can keep on giving and giving and giving. Um, It's kind of like, let's say that there are two brothers and a mom decides, you know what, I'm going to give these boys two gifts and it's a really cool toy. You do, that's right. So maybe we can pretend it's Slade and Luke in this story. Um, So let's say mom gives these two brothers uh, two toys. One brother decides that he is going to take it and hide it because some friends come over after school, and he doesn't want anybody to touch it. He doesn't want anybody to share the toy. But the other brother says, you know what? When my friends come over, I'm going to share this. I want everybody to play with this toy. I want to share it. You can't have any friends over? Well, that's okay. That's okay, too. Yeah, you might can go to their house. The same scenario might play out. Um, So when mom sees that one person hid the toy and, like, refused to share it, but the other son played with it and used it, do you think, who, who is going to get more toys to play with? Probably the one who decided to share, right? Because they're using those toys and those resources for really good purposes and reasons. Uh, I'll, maybe you can be in the example next week. How's that sound? Okay. So I want everybody to remember this week that we can use the resources God gives us for good things, and God wants us to use those resources that he gives us. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for showing us how to use our resources wisely. God, I pray that we continue to use all of the many talents and the gifts and the resources that you give us um, to share with others. 
um, and to grow your kingdom more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can head back to your seat. As Justin mentioned earlier, uh, tonight we have the privilege of hosting uh, composer, singer, songwriter, Scott Wesley Brown, and this morning's Praise Him is one of his selections. So we hope that you will um, come tonight and uh, join us with uh, St. Stephen's as uh, he shares his story and song uh, this evening at 6.30. So please stand and join me. Uh, I'll ask that you sing the verses with me on He Will Carry You. You bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we gather today in all of your goodness and mercy, in the service of worship and the Thanksgiving holiday that is upon us. Together, invite us to reflect on what you've given us and how we're using the resources that you've placed in each of our lives. As we reflect on these things, we ask that you would fill our hearts with both gratitude and also grace. Gratitude for how you've strengthened us to do what is just and right, for how you've empowered us to make a difference. But grace too, O oh Lord, grace for how and when we failed and missed the mark. Lord, while we tend to think about big things in life, I pray that this holiday season will help us to reclaim the value of the little things that make our lives so rich and meaningful. The gathering of family and friends, and fellowship around simple tables, the beauty of good food, the hug of a mother or grandmother, the laughter of children, the rhythms of our calendars, and our old but sacred and rich traditions. And all things, O oh God, help us to see your beauty and feel your presence. Loving God, I know that the holidays can be particularly challenging for those who 
experience isolation in so many different ways. So I pray now, O oh God, specifically for the families that will grieve this holiday season. I pray for those who are physically in prison, those who are separated from their families. I pray, Lord, for those who are away serving our country. Lord, I lift up the college students and young adults who don't have the means or schedules to go home this week. I pray for those, Lord, who have outlived so many of their friends, some folks in the community whose families have abandoned them later in life. Lord, I pray for folks who have all the support in the world, yet mentally and emotionally they find themselves so far removed from so many people this week. Loving God, I pray that as the great Emmanuel, you will begin to be present even now. Lord, I pray that as your church, that we will both celebrate uh, the peace, love, the hope, and joy that we find in you. But I also pray that, that we will be observant and available in these holiday weeks so that we may become your hands and your feet, so that we might, may make sure that, that the joy that we find in you and the joy that we find in one another gets shared to all those who need to experience your healing touch. Oh Lord, you have created us for yourself and for one another, and today we gather to reflect on what it means to live together as your beloved community and to serve your world. So now, let us pray together as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Will you join your thanksgiving prayer with mine? Father God, at this time of thanksgiving approaches, help us to remember that when we have food, remember the hungry. When we have work, remember the jobless. When we have a warm home, remember the homeless. 
and when we are without pain, remember those who are suffering. Father, may these not just be words, but imprints on our hearts. Help us to never take the smallest things for granted, because we are only here by the loving grace of our Savior. Let each of us give our tithes and offerings from deep within our hearts, because giving has and will change us. Just as Jesus gave his life for us, our lives are changed forever. In the merciful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Good morning. 
Our scripture reading from this morning is Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five, golds, five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I have, I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money in, on deposit in the bank, bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These words are a gift from God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Charlotte Ann, for reading our text for the morning. If you are exhausted by Matthew's gospel, which I have uh, been preaching from since July, the good news is you've just got one more week uh, after today, Reign of Christ Sunday and our... Uh, preaching from Matthew and the lectionary will come come to an end. But, but chapter 25 contains uh, what I think are two of Jesus' most well-known uh, parables. And this morning we focus on the parable of talents, which you all know very well. And I want to preach on the subject of motivation checks. It's always a good idea for us, I think, to make sure that our motivation in life matches our justification for whatever it is that we set ourselves out to do. Because sometimes human beings can do things for all the wrong reasons, but we've all discovered in our own lives that we can usually provide ample justification, can't we? And as we consider today's passage, the questions I want us to ask is, what motivated the servants in today's parable to respond to life in the ways that they did? Were they driven by passion? Were they driven by misplaced passion? Were they driven by faith? Were they driven by fear? What is it that, that motivates us when we wake up each morning and we, uh, we go out to seize the day? Now, it's been said of parables that parables are conversation starters. Parables don't tell us everything that we want to know about God. And sometimes there are certain aspects of parables that we apply to God that probably aren't uh, accurate depictions of, of who God is, certainly not the God that, that came to us in, in, in Jesus Christ that we worship here in this sanctuary each, each week. Parables can yield all kinds of meanings, and only on isolated occasions does Jesus actually give us an explanation for how we're supposed to interpret them. So I would imagine that if I broke you all up into ten groups and sent you all to ten different rooms, then you would all have ten different conversations about this parable. 
and I have probably uh, preached the sermons that would come out of some of those conversations, but I don't think I've ever preached this one. And in today's conversation, what I want to focus on is the power of our motivations. Those that are seen and those that are unseen. Sometimes I've been motivated in ways that I didn't really realize it at, at, at the time, but this is an important thing for us to reflect on this day. And in today's parable, there is an audit. That's not a word that you all want to hear as we uh, come near the end of a fiscal year and you begin to think about tax season. Like when the IRS sends you a letter in the mail to check up on you and make sure that you're being honest with your taxes. Kind of like when the finance committee, this is for you all, sends you a letter in the mail asking you to assess your annual giving to the church based on the abundance of gifts that God has, has given you. Audits are important, aren't they? And this parable reminds us that when our lives come to an end, there is going to be an audit of sorts. The gospel writer wants us to think about the many things that we have been entrusted with and encourages us to ask how we might provide justification based on the motivations that caused us to respond to life however we have responded. So Jesus tells this story about a master that has gone away on a journey and entrusted the workers with talents. Now, a, a talent was worth 6,000 days' wages. That's between 15 and 20 years of earnings. So in this parable, they were entrusted with an enormous amount of wealth. In fact, my commentary suggests that the person who received five talents would have received about $3 million worth of money. Now, that's a lot. And the person who only received one uh, talent would have received about $600,000 worth of cash in today's money. So this parable represents, I think, the abundance of gifts, maybe that God gives us across the duration of our entire lives. So we're thinking on a big scale. And in the story, the first two put their money to work and, and they, they doubled the money. We might say that they were active. We might say that they were, uh, they were faithful uh, that, that they were productive, but the third one took his, took his money and buried it in the sand. And when the boss returns, he is severely reprimanded and punished. Now, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the third man, because I think he was simply doing what everybody else was doing, and therein resides the problem. Did you know that it was a very common practice to do what he did in the first century? It was a common practice to take your money, to take your possessions, things that are valuable to you, and bury those things in the sand for safekeeping so that they would not be stolen by someone else. One could not just run down to Dick's Sporting Goods for a Black Friday sale and buy themselves a new safe. You had to do what you had to do. We have another parable about buried treasure, so we, we see this in, in, in the text. And the last thing this man wanted to do was to lose the master's wealth. And I also think he buried it because he knew that he had more to lose than the other two servants. You see, they could afford to lose most of their money that they were given, and they would still have more money than this one man. So we might also say that out of his fear, this man compared himself to the other servants, and he made his decisions accordingly. And the path that he chose demanded nothing of him, and it ensured that he would have something for himself and for the master when the master returned. And so on audit day, it appears that this man was pretty confident in the justification that he was going to give for his actions. He said, matter-of-factly, I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So he says, so I was afraid. I was afraid. Now, Jesus was not a harsh man, and to be honest, Jesus would have probably been standing graciously with the person who received the least amount of talents because that's who Jesus is. So, so I can't accept this universal image for, for God as some folks do in this passage, and I don't think that all of the qualities of this master resemble the God we know in Jesus Christ. But I do think the story seems to offer what I think is a universally accepted truth about life. When we are motivated by the wrong kind of fear... We never truly discover our joy, and we never truly discover our purpose. You see, the man's justification 
It, it seems was what we might describe as fiscal conservatism. That is, he put his money in the safest place possible with little to no risk. But you see, his real motivation was fear, which he seems to think is an acceptable justification for his actions. It was fear that led this man to do what everybody else was doing. And fear, I think, is an area where so many people are confused about God. We might say particularly in the evangelical South. We focus, we can focus on the abundance of God in the passage, or we can focus on the wrath of God in the passage. And so many have used fear to motivate faith over the years. We have Old Testament passages, of course, that tell us to fear the Lord, which one which could possibly encourage one to take this passage very literally as an image for God. Prosperity gospel preachers have convinced folks that if you don't sow your $100 seed right now, then you're going to go broke. The eschatological preachers have convinced folks that damnation and judgment are near. And I suppose it all really just depends on which aspects of the biblical tradition that we want to consider of most significance. But I'm drawn to this idea of a God who gives abundantly, this God who gives to us generously, the God who gives to us extravagantly. This is a remarkable amount of wealth that these servants have been entrusted with. And then I'm drawn to the fact that they were all given wealth to manage based on their own ability to manage it. So what we witness in the parable are individuals who were not giving more than they could handle but they were given precisely what the master knew they could handle. This master knew these servants so well that he knew exactly what they could be trusted with. When you wake up every morning, let me ask you, what is it that motivates you to walk out the door and to seize another day? Are you motivated by faith in this God who has given you everything that you need, the God who has uniquely gifted you with the gifts and talents that you need to become precisely who God has called you to be? Or do you start your day with fear? Perhaps a fear of failure, that you maybe lack what is needed for the day. Perhaps that you can't do what God is calling you to do. That grace is not enough for whatever sin you've been guilty of in the past. Fear that if you give anything at all, that you might actually lose everything. We know there is plenty for us to be afraid of today. And there are so many sources inside the church and outside the church telling us to be afraid. And the parable tells us that this man was condemned because I think he was paralyzed by his unhealthy fears. Now, fear, of course, can be a healthy motivator. For instance, we know not to walk out onto Gwen Avenue in front of a car because we've seen reports for folks who have been hit by vehicles. We know not to touch a hot oven because we know what heat can do. Healthy fear is necessary for survival. But, you know, fear is also the most debilitating and often manipulated emotion in our existence. And what did fear do to this man? It shut him down. The text tells us that it made him it lazy. It caused him, caused him to look inward instead of outward. You know, fear is usually rooted in some kind of insecurity. And I think it is the ultimate bridge to self-preservation. So... Let's ask ourselves today, how might fear manifest itself in our lives? How could fear manifest itself in our church? How does fear manifest itself in our country? How does fear serve as the motivator that creates insecure and self-centered and even self-righteous qualities in all of us? And how does fear serve to bury our money and talents in the ground that could be utilized in so many different ways. And how does fear ultimately bring our lives and our witness to destruction? When couples come to me for premarital counseling, we have a lot of conversation, but one of the questions that I often ask them is, are you capable of living the rest of your life without the person next to you? And I always get the exact same response. And it's usually... Uh, it, it's usually one who reaches over to the other, grabs them by the hand, and says something like, I just cannot imagine living the rest of my life without this person. And they think that's the right answer. And I'll often tell them, I didn't ask you if you want to live the rest of your life without the person next to you. What I ask you is, 
Are you capable? Do you feel confident that you could live the rest of your life without the person next to you? The real question that I'm asking are, is, are, are, are you getting married because you're afraid of spending the rest of your life alone? Are you running from something? Or are you running toward something? Because I've had so many young couples come to me and what I discover is, is that when they got married, one of them was running from something instead of running to something. More often than not, they think about it, and, and, and yes, we're all a little bit afraid of being alone, aren't we? But it's a fear that we, work, that we work through and we deal with. Because if you're not happy with yourself, then you're not going to be happy with anybody else either. When you're motivated by fear and not faith, you are burying yourself, and you will never give fully of yourself. You go and you sign your children up for Little League sports, but the next thing you know, you're having to check your motivations. My little boy is quite a soccer player, and I have to check my competitive spirit when I'm watching him play soccer because your initial motivation to foster teamwork, fun, and make memories can very easily take a back seat to your fear that your child may not be the MVP or that your child may be anything less than who, what you have determined that your child should be. You go to the gym every single morning and you follow that diet to a T. But why? Is it because you just respect the temple, the body that God has given you and you want to be healthy and you want to live a long life so that you might see your grandchildren graduate from college? Or is it because every time you look in the mirror what you see is ugly and it's something that you're not, that you're not proud of? Because you're always comparing yourself to others. What is your motivation? How many people are driving nice cars? I'm thinking about this because we're car shopping. How many people are driving nice cars because of their safety record and convenience features, living in nice homes so they can share them and bring the whole community over and everybody have a place to sit? What are the motivations for people to go to the churches that they go to? Some folks go to the First Baptist Church in town because it rings of status. Other folks go to their church because they're afraid if they don't that grandma might roll over in her grave. Fear. Church members have come to me through the years and they say things to me like, Pastor, well if we do this, then, then this might happen and then this might happen and then this might happen or if we don't do, do that, then this won't happen. And, and it's just always this, this, this fear-based mentality that prevents us from taking risk and doing and being who God has called us to be. If, 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 and I want to say, if the frog had wings, but I don't. But the truth is that fear will render each of you in the church incapable of ever becoming who God has created you to be. And when we really do an audit of our lives, how often do we discover deep down that fear is truly the root cause of so many things and that fear is a prime mover for why we do so many things that we do. Those personal audits are very important if you're going to experience purpose, joy, and fulfillment in life. Because if you're motivated by fear, then you're always going to be afraid. Because there's always somebody that's going to have a bigger house than mine. There's always someone that's going to have a nicer car than mine. There's always someone who is going to be better looking than I am. There's always someone that's going to have a faster running back than your son. Fear of failure, fear of missing out, fear of appearing a certain way, fear of losing what you have today because you're afraid of what tomorrow might bring will always lead to a lack of purpose and a lack of joy. And our fullest potential in life will forever remain buried in the sand because we have chosen just to be status quo like so many others, as the man in the text did. You know, one of the greatest struggles, I think, for our country right now is that so many people are motivated by the wrong kind of fear. So many Americans are glued to their cable news channels just eating fear with a spoon like a bowl of ice cream. As influential people use fear to control us, and rather than telling us what we are capable of, we're so often told what and who we need to be afraid of. Fear the immigrants and fear the police and fear the leftists and fear the right-wing Christians and 
Fear the Chinese and fear everything that isn't like you. And the obvious fears that we should be talking about never really make it to the platform. But you see, this is the kind of fear that will just never unite people. It's the type of fear that will never enable us to discover our purpose and our joy. And movements that are based in fear of otherness or fear of losing wealth or notoriety or prestige are movements that will never end well because fear causes us to bury our very best selves in the sand. And we will always keep more than we give and we will always exclude more than we include. One Sunday morning when I was on my last deployment, I had a sailor who was deeply troubled and I had done about all I could with this particular sailor. But this sailor came into my, into my office and introduced me to this Zach Williams song. And I didn't really know much about Zach Williams, although um, Zach Williams and Dolly Parton did a song together about a year ago. And that's literally all I knew about Zach Williams. But I was introduced to this song, and I love it now. It's one of my favorites. It's called Fear. Fear's a liar. Have you heard that song? It opens and goes something like this. I won't sing it. I should have made Lance sing it, but you're off the hook today, maybe next time. But it opens with, when you're told that you are not good enough, when he told you that you're not right, when he told you that you're not strong enough to put up a good fight, when he told you that you're not worthy, when he told you that you're not loved, when he told you that you're not beautiful, that you'll never be enough, fear, the song says, fear is a liar. Fear will take your breath and stop you in your steps. And fear will rob you of your rest. And fear will steal your happiness. So cast your fears into the fire. Because fear, fear really is a liar, isn't it? Fear is such a liar. And straight from the shallowness of hell itself. And it is so evident throughout the scriptures. Have you ever thought more deeply about why the prodigal son demanded his inheritance early and wasted away his life? Have you ever thought about the motivation for those actions? I think he was, it was because he was too afraid to wait for his inheritance. He was afraid that he would never get it. He was afraid that somebody else might take it away from him. He was afraid to trust God. I don't remember which scholar said it, but one scholar says that in this parable, this servant, it wasn't that he failed to trust the market. It's that he failed to trust the master. And then do you know why the older brother got mad when the prodigal son came home and his daddy threw a party for him? Because he was afraid that he had lost his daddy's affection. Have you ever thought about why Abraham took matters into his own hands and had Ishmael with Hagar instead of waiting for God to give him Isaac with Sarah? Because he was afraid that he may never be the father of many nations and he couldn't trust the master's will for his life. Why did Cain kill his brother Abel? Because he feared that his brother offering was better than his. Why did the Israelites hoard manna in the wilderness? Because they were afraid that it was going to run out. Why did Peter denied Jesus three times, warming himself by the fire because he was afraid that he might be next and Jesus couldn't come through on all those promises of resurrection. And why, in today's parable, does this man go and bury his gifts, his talents, his money? Why does he go and bury it all in the sand? He says, because I was afraid. And fear really is a liar. It grants us permission to bury our potential and waste away our lives instead of exercising the kind of faithful courage to which God has called us to. But do you know what Jesus did for us? He didn't buy himself a No Fear t-shirt from the 1990s. Any of you have some of those? He didn't fight like a scared cat who was backed into a corner. But from Galilee to Jerusalem, Jesus gave himself. He didn't bury his gifts and talents and opportunities in the sand, but he permitted himself willingly to be buried in the tomb, trusting that God could and would give him new life. And Jesus left behind a legacy 
of sacrificial love that has risen up leader after leader after leader for some 2,000 years. Real leaders who use love to inspire and lift entire populations of people to achieve their full potential. It is the same kind of love that has lifted you. It is the kind of love that has lifted me. As 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and a spirit of a sound mind. And 1 John teaches us that there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear, the text says, has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. As God's people, we are motivated by love and grace and mercy and peace and hope and faith. And these are the things that we're called to share with the world. These are the things that we're called to reinvest in the world because these are the things that God has so richly shared with us. We're called to jump out of the boat courageously and to risk our safety and personal security to bring about the goodness of God in the world and in all people. You know, some folks live their lives asking the question, what can I afford to lose? But when we study the life and teachings of Jesus, the question that we're encouraged to ask ourselves is what can we really afford to keep? What can we really afford to keep when we consider all that God has given to us? Because we serve a God who kept nothing from us, but a God who gave all of God's self to us, even God's Son. The increase comes in life when we give generously of ourselves. The increase comes when we plant love freely, when we sow generosity liberally, when we sacrifice consistently. Fear doesn't give. It really doesn't. Love gives. Love gives all. Faith gives. The Apostle Paul didn't say that we are justified by our fears, but he said that we are all justified by our faith. So let us, church, never be motivated by all of the wrong kinds of fear, so that when the audit comes and we look back over the totality of our lives, we'll be able to say that faith and not fear was our prime mover. And it was Jesus who said, what about faith? Jesus said that faith has the power to move mountains. But fear is nothing more than a liar that leads to the deprivation of our witness and the destruction of our purpose. So hear this today, if you've heard nothing else, that God has given every single one of you, no matter where you are at in your life, whether you're a child, whether you're in high school, whether you're a young parent, whether you're an empty nester, whether you're retired, whether you think that God has nothing else for you to do in this walk of life, God has uniquely equipped you for this particular moment in time to bear witness to the love of God and to make a difference in this world. So don't bury your gifts. Don't bury your talents. Don't bury your money. And don't bury your life in the sand. You know, the Thanksgiving and Christmas seasons are opportunities for all of us to do an audit. An audit that calls upon us to consider how we're going to invest ourselves and how we are investing ourselves into our communities and into our families. So may we all take this season and all these opportunities to invest ourselves, to sacrifice ourselves, to immerse ourselves, and to give ourselves to something that is so much bigger than ourselves. And that something is a somebody, and that somebody is Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. So surrender it all today so that when the audit comes, God will not say, that you've been fearful. But when the audit comes, you want God to be able to say that you have been faithful. Faithful in just a few things, the master in the parable says. So now I'm going to make you master over many. May it be so this day and every day for each of us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As Lance comes forward to lead us in our hymn of response, today if there are things that you need to surrender to God, this is a moment where I invite you to do that as we lift our voices in song. I trust that all of us as we sing together will lift our voices in gratitude for what God has done for us and that the Holy Spirit will challenge us to go forth and to be more, to love more, and to give more 
and be the people that God has called us to be for such a time as this. Hymn 473. told this microphone died, so I better use this one. We thank you today for your presence in this time of, of worship. Um, as we go this week, we'll be in prayer for Ruth and Roger as he goes in for a procedure, and he came down to make us, make us aware of that so that we can be in prayer for them as they go down to the hospital um, this, this week. I do hope to see uh, some of you this afternoon or this evening, however your schedules permit, as we begin to, to decorate uh, for the Advent and Christmas season. And the concert tonight is going to be very, very special, so I hope that you'll all make plans to come out and be with us for that. If you're a guest today and, uh, and I haven't had a chance to meet you, if you're a guest today and I have had a chance to meet you, I'd love to speak to you again and we'll meet you over here by the side doors. Let's bow our heads and I'll send you forth with this, with this blessing and benediction. So let us go now, church, to love and care for one another in the name of Christ. And may God bless you with every gift needed to be the hands and feet of Christ this week. May the Spirit grant you the willingness to risk yourself now and forevermore for the sake of the gospel. And may the love and hope and faith of Jesus Christ our Lord dwell richly with you now and forevermore. Amen.